Half a year ago, everything was different. Half a year ago, everyone was different. No one was afraid of stars falling over the reservoir. No one paid attention to the smoke that rose through cracks in the dark ground. At night and in the street, and in this noise and in the headlights between death and love, she buries her face into his shoulder, pounds him desperately with fists, cries and screams in the dark. I don't want to see this, she says. I can't carry all of this inside of me. Extract from Rhinoceros, a poem by Serhi Jadal. I remember those last months in Kiev, January and February, as if they were the arms of lost lovers to which we can never again return. There was snow on the ground, and news of Russian tanks gathered like storm clouds on the horizon, and in their crosshairs were our lives here, in independent Ukraine. On Russia's hands already was eight years of bloodshed that had murdered thousands, and displaced millions, and reduced the eastern metropolises to smoking shells. Very little about this is complicated not unless you're looking to find excuses for this evil imperialism. And some people do that for a living. Others do it for fun on the internet. Fantasy is what informs our opinions in the absence of any real knowledge. But these geopolitical fantasies rarely consider the sovereign people of Ukraine, the future they want and the voice they have as an independent nation. So I started working on this documentary with the intention of getting the truth out there myself, but of course, time ran out for everybody. This is Kiev. I live here. My friends live here. Their families live here. It's a metropolis of three million people. And quite frankly, we have enough personal and professional dramas to contend with without the additional threat of being colonized by a belligerent foreign power. The probability of war breaking out is simply too damn high for comfort and should trouble come to us it will be with the intent of kneecapping democracy in this region Belarusification and of course the byproducts of war civilian casualties and economic damage we are sleeping at night with our futures in the air and our present in the arms of the armed forces and if I stumbled in my speech there, it was because I'd written those words down on a piece of paper the night before, and in the light of day, as children played in the park beside me, and couples walked hand in hand, I couldn't believe what I was saying. War. War. The end of liberty in Ukraine at best. A nuclear holocaust at worst. And even though I'd carefully reflected on this prediction, it felt truly ridiculous to say it. And I doubted myself enough to give that intro another few takes, trying to obfuscate and be one of those people that say nothing at all in front of a camera, rather than a person that says too much and comes across as unhinged. That's the power of Russian propaganda. It terrifies us from the inside out, makes us second guess our own instincts and realities. Because what we in Kiev through the winter could clearly see lumbering over the steps towards us was exactly that. War. War tanks, missiles, a hundred thousand troops, federation flags held by boy soldiers that had been trained to hate. This danger was surely no fiction. 
the last like couple of months, uh, Europe showed their support. Artyom Derofeyev is a civil servant who works in Ukraine's intelligence department, specializing in decoding misinformation. His degree was in Russian-Ukrainian relations, so his were instincts that I felt I could trust. Last question, Artyom. Um, basically, you work in misinformation, and right now there is a lot of uh, anxiety, there's a lot of fear about the, the prospect of war happening. Zelensky has said that we should not be afraid, we should not be so scared about war. But the Americans and the British, they are saying that war is going to happen. It's absolutely going to happen. And people are confused because should we be afraid or should we not be afraid? Should we prepare or should we not prepare? Поэтому, скорее всего, это ограничится все какими-то провокациями, начиная с кибератак, которые у нас проходят уже третью неделю. Или, может быть, провокация на Донбассе. Ну, как-то так. So, <coughs> Zelensky said that there could be a war, but we shouldn't be afraid of it because like, we've been in a war for eight years now. And people in the West, they're afraid because like lots of Western investors have their businesses in Ukraine and they're afraid that if the war starts, uh, they might lose a lot of money. They might need to close their businesses and there will be a major loss. Uh, and uh, Artem believes, believes that we should trust our common sense and understand like uh, why Putin needs this war. and. Uh, what he might benefit from it. Uh, at the same time, uh, people say that if he starts war, he's going to lose it. Uh, so there just might be, like, instead of a war, there just might be some some things going around in Donetsk region or some other provocations, like all of cyber attacks that we've been having or some I other minor provocations going around, but not like a uh, big war happening. Understood. Thank you so much for your time, Artem, and thank you, Julia. Uh, thank you. Have a nice evening. The translator's name is Julia Zaparia, my good friend and colleague. We work together Monday through Friday, but today's Sunday, so we're meeting instead on Krishatik for a coffee. Julia's from Dnipro in eastern Ukraine but her mother's side of the family all come from Crimea, the peninsula in the south that was taken by Russia in 2014. No one from her Crimean family, not even her elderly grandfather, has answered a telephone in eight years. They are Russian now, and this is war. And that's the human cost, a hard border through the hearts of families blinded by mudslinging, brother against sister and father against son. Overton windows opened wide to the extremes, Everyone's a nationalist or everyone's a separatist, and you're either with us or you're against us, and the middle ground is all lava. This is not going on the documentary. This is, this is warming up. <laughs> it's kind of funny though, isn't it? The angle that... <laughs> Obviously, I had the thought that why not go and teach abroad? And one possibility of that could be like go and teach somebody in Europe. But unfortunately, I cannot do that because, like, to get a job in Europe, you have to have a work permit. Mm -hmm. And to get a work permit, you have to firstly be college. Yeah. Yes. So you're kind of stuck because you have a Ukrainian passport. Yes. And yes. Uh, if Ukraine was in the European Union, would it be possible for you to work in Europe? Of course, that, that would make things so much easier. Mm -hmm. Yes, having a European national passport. Mm -hmm. So I could go and teach anywhere in Europe. Mm -hmm. Would you ever consider working in Russia? Mm, no. Why not? Oh, Ukraine and Russia used to be, used to be kind of friends. But in 2013, when all this situation happened, it, it wouldn't be even fair to go there and work for people who, whose government uh, 
did this, all these terrible things. The political history of Ukraine since 1991 reminds me of the backhanded Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times. There have been three revolutions here in just 30 years of independence. Three points when governments had crumbled under the weight of mass protest. And while this alludes to Ukraine's struggles, it also shows us how powerful democracy is here. Ukraine has a free press and freedom of speech. Its citizens have the right to protest and a culture of using it. Nothing like this exists in the Russian Federation, which proposes to strip Ukrainians of their hard-won freedoms. These political refugees from Belarus understand exactly how that feels. For them, the freedom Ukrainians enjoy is everything they could hope for in their own country. Interview of us, Moshna, no, I'm Yet, Like Ukraine, Belarus is another dark spot on the European map where important things are happening in plain sight. Unfortunately, neither they nor I could find a sufficient level to talk politics in a common language. And language does remain as an iron curtain between Western journalism and pro-democracy movements and the Russophone satellites of Eastern Europe. They can't tell us their truth if we can't understand it. Ukrainians didn't inherit their freedom. This generation has had to fight for every inch, and in the name of every martyr that gave their life. Over a hundred civilians were killed by their own police force during the Revolution of Dignity that took place in the winter months of 2013 and 2014. Marina Litvinchuk was involved in those protests that happened here on Maidan Nezalezhnosti and in the surrounding streets of Kiev's central square. Her brother was shot in the leg by cops. We were there with our families, we sang songs, it was Christmas parties here, and it was so, all, all ideas, all in spite of this idea. And in the last days uh, it became so dangerous and I wasn't here. Mm -hmm. What uh, made it dangerous? What happened? Uh, it was a lot of weapons and um, I want to tell a story about my brother. He was injured here and the uh, uh, bullet uh, came uh, through the, near the artery uh, and uh, strike inside the bone. And, and he was in the hospital and Estonia helped uh, to re in rehabilitation in the uh, hospital. And, uh, but in the story there is a good sign because uh, this situation there united Ukrainians. And we now have increasing interest uh, for our tradition, for our culture, for our songs. It's important to bear in mind that the majority of Ukrainians were not born in Ukraine, but in the Soviet Union. For many of us, nationhood was an accident of our birth. For Ukrainians, it's been an active process of learning their own language and reconnecting with traditions. Giving shape to what being a Ukrainian means is a creative act and a civic responsibility here. They are a proud people. They have every right to feel proud of their country because they are building it, and to be proud of yourself against a bully that thinks nothing of you is an act of rebellion. Marina, what do you hope is going to happen in Ukraine in the future? Uh, no, we don't know what will, uh, what will happen in the future. Of course, I'm scared of war in Ukraine, and I'm scared that teachers at schools uh, telling uh, their students about where uh, bomb shelters are, and uh, I'm uh, uh, in families, of course, we're discussing uh, situation about all about situation, and we're discussing how we will help the army in future and what what we will do in the case of war in Ukraine. And I'm scared uh, that my husband, uh, if it necessary, will take weapon in their arms. And of course, if so, uh, it scared me. But uh, well, this is the situation uh, nowadays. Mm -hmm. And what, what, do you, what future do you want from Ukraine? I, uh, of course I know that the future of Ukraine will be good. Because it's not the first time we have the problems with Russia or with other nations, unfortunately. And uh, uh, of course we need the help of Europe, we need the help of America, uh, America helping them. Because without them we can't... Uh, str uh, can't, uh, uh, can't, 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 how to say this... Uh, we can move forward. Yeah, yes, we can move forward. Uh, it's, uh, it's rather hard for us to be near so, so big and so aggressive country. Eight years separate the revolution in 2014 and the existential threat of 2022. But to understand why Ukraine is being threatened today, we have to take a step back in time to the threat that they defeated yesterday.
They self-organised sleeping in shifts, crashing in government buildings, occupying the halls of power, the citizens who would not be ignored. This didn't just happen in Kiev. In total, ten government buildings were occupied by activists, from Kharkiv to Khmelnytsky, Vinitsa, Lviv, Zhitomir. But what of these people, I hear you saying? Don't they have jobs to go to? Somewhere more important to be? There are lawyers here, and plumbers, students, and street sweepers, nurses, and teachers, men and women, and in some cases their children too. It need not matter who they were. For each person here, nothing was more important than justice. But how did such a cross-section of the population find themselves becoming radicalised, to the point of risking their lives over an EU trade agreement? The story of the revolution of dignity and the sacrifices of the Heavenly Hundred has taken on an almost biblical weight. It might just be eight years old, but it's the foundational tale that modern Ukraine is built upon. It's the story of a proven liar and a cheat called Viktor Yanukovych, who was elected president on the basis that he would take Ukraine into the European Union. It's the story of that president's sudden and pathetic U-turn in light of Moscow's rage, betraying his electorate to appease his masters. That's what drove the young people, like Marina, to take direct action in November 2013. They were the millennials, the first generation of Ukrainians for over 300 years, to whom Russia is just another foreign country. The first Ukrainians would distance in their eyes to compare coldly the prosperity enjoyed in the EU states on the western border with the corruption and isolation within Ruski Mir, Russia's sphere of influence. What kind of future would you want for your country? Something like Czechia, or something like Transnistria. When the police started beating up the protesters, that's when the older generations came out too, to condemn the police brutality, to protect the lives of their children, who were fighting for the integrity of their democracy, demanding a government that answers to them and not to Vladimir Putin. At its height, there were 200,000 protesters outside his palace window, and Yanukovych was terrified and escalated the situation fatally by passing laws that criminalised the protests. Overnight, everyday people, who had never before found themselves in any trouble, were demonised as Nazis and fugitives, to be shot at, imprisoned and killed. From that point, there really was no going home again. The people stayed strong. The Yanukovych government fell in the February and fled to Russia in disgrace. This is what a revolution looks like. And for these Kievan revolutionaries, a light appeared at the end of darkness that had been three months long. But it's one of life's cruelest ironies, isn't it? That we always outlive the happy endings that we make for ourselves. Ukraine had won the battle, but a war was about to begin. On a television screen or in a good book, a story often unfolds towards a clean and satisfying conclusion. The wedding march plays, the crowds cheer and the credits roll, and it all comes across as being quite relatable. The muscle memory of a smile might even flinch across your face as you recall your own moments of raw glory, back when you got the girl, when the battle was won. But then, unfortunately, life goes on, and new tests present themselves before you. Disillusion, disappointment, boredom, loss and disagreement, all these weeds are forever growing around the green fields of our own contentment, on a long enough timescale. The glory always fades. That brief period of peace for Ukrainian democracy after the Maidan victory was equally short-lived. Ukrainians had dared to defy Russian interests, and that was the catalyst for Moscow's revenge, which began with Crimea. Then, separatist groups began to riot in every major city across the south and the east of the country. Their intention? To smash Ukraine into tiny little states that the Russian Federation could more easily control. In Luhansk and Donetsk, which make up two-thirds of the Donbass region. The separatist forces were armed by Russia and succeeded in breaking away with disastrous consequences. The ensuing civil war made refugees out of 2.6 million people and claimed the lives of 14,000. Worst of all, this war would never end. I'm on my way to meet with Ivan Botovoy, who comes from Donetsk. His entire family are refugees, now safely resettled in the town of Irpin, just outside Kiev. Coming from Donbass, geographically closer to Moscow than Europe, 
His patriotism is a different flavour, more sober and measured than his compatriots in Kiev, for example. He's going to give me some insight into why his hometown was unable to resist the pro-Russian coup that took place. like, uh, you know, probably in Lviv they have some type of cafe, they you under the ground and it's like, uh, I don't know, it's like a uh, place. Like a cellar? Yeah, 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 yeah. Football. Football, yeah, yeah, actually. And we talk about politician situation in Ukraine and it's like, I was, uh, I was growing up in um, Lugansk and at the same time in Donetsk, was my grandparents I lived in Lugansk. I am a uh, Russian native speaker, and most of the cases I speak Russian with my friends, even if they speak Ukrainian language. Uh, so, but I could uh, notice that uh, people who speak Ukrainian, they originally from western part of Ukraine, mm -hmm. so the mindset uh, a bit different from the people from Kharkiv and Donetsk. This area, for all the time, was being uh, like a border between Russia and Ukraine, so we have hybrid mentality. Uh, so I came part, I take a part of mentality from Russian television of Russian friends that was out of our borders before I uh, start studying in university. I uh, have been in Moscow to Moscow just once, and at the same time I have been in Kyiv. Uh, once too. So I felt that it was uncomfortable, but at the same time, when I uh, was in Kiev, I feel the same. So I don't know, it's like uh, you know, in post Soviet uh, territory, we have like a singer, Meladze, probably, and, and he sings a lot of songs, he very popular of older generation, and he had uh, a, sing a song. Um, which uh, and words and uh, lyrics of this song uh, in Russian it sounds uh, which translate I am like a stranger in all the places when I go so mm -hmm. I'm originally from Donetsk but it's a hybrid area that not Russia not Ukraine I could say it's my film probably other people have different mm -hmm. Ukrainian society is effortlessly multilingual, especially in the melting pots of the big cities. It's common to hear both Ukrainian and Russian languages spoken, sometimes even within the same conversation. Language transcends politics. However, the prevalence of the Russian language in South and Eastern Ukraine is a weakness that Russia has been able to exploit. I come from Scotland. It's a relatively small country. Most of the media consumed in Scotland isn't made there, but produced in much bigger countries like England or America. Likewise, if you live in Ukraine and are consuming media in the Russian language, the majority of content will have been produced not in Ukraine, but in the Russian Federation, where the Kremlin has a direct influence over the news narratives. That's why Ivan's initial reaction to the Maidan revolution was one of great scepticism. His sources had been poisoning him for years, telling him these protesters were Nazis and Jewish and radically, dangerously gay. He couldn't get his head around what was happening, but with the help and empathy of his friend in Kiev, Ivan was able to find his way to the truth. Others had a much sterner awakening. Ivan once told me about an ex-girlfriend he had back in Luhansk. Apparently she adored Putin until a shell from a Russian tank struck the house of her mother, who fell out of the building into the street and broke her back on the asphalt. The Ukrainian army saved the mother's life and the girlfriend gave a TV interview thanking them. I couldn't believe it, he said. What, that you seen her in the news? I asked. No, that she said something positive about Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, so but, but during the revolution, where were you? <clears throat> yeah, uh, at 20, at 13, I was in Kiev. I was studying in my first year uh, on university. So before, by the moment of revolution, I was in Kiev for a one year and uh, for me it was a really rough year because um, this uh, drastic move going from Donbass area on the Donbass area to Kyiv uh, I feel like I'm in Kyiv 
uh, people here, as for me, had a different um, different opinion all about uh, situation in the bus and all about feeling in uh, involved say place in Europe. So I feel a bit uh, uncomfortable, mm -hmm. uh, unconfident at the same time because okay, it's a big, big city with other uh, with people with other mentality. Mm -hmm. And at the start of revolution, uh, I remember that I had a lot of thoughts that I can't comprehend why they do this, why they try to change something in this way, this uh, vital way, because it was a lot of murders. But after, afterwards, afterwards, a lot uh, of murders. At the revolution, yeah. Maidan revolution. Murders from the authorities against these people. I I, I don't know I didn't know mm -hmm. what's happening but I I've seen uh, I had seen a lot of uh, from te television a lot of information that a lot of students a lot of just uh, people was killed by somebody I know mm -hmm. but interesting point and you interesting do you when you seen this you thought why are they protesting yeah. Mm -hmm. At the, at the beginning, yeah. I can't explain to myself why they do this, mm -hmm. why a lot of students go to Maidan mm -hmm. and try to do this because, hey, you are students, you should uh, study. No, after, after studying, you could come back to um, life, political life of Ukraine by trying to change through your professional activity. Why you try to do this with just having you on Maidan and trying to protest. Uh, what what moved you? Uh, what moved you? I can't explain to myself. But, but, you, but you changed your opinion during yeah, this Yeah, after, after this mm -hmm. one year. Uh, yeah, uh, my, uh, my point of view uh, gradually changed mm -hmm. because a lot of my friends were out trying to explain me mm -hmm. and uh, I take this point. I take this point and I communicate. But, at the same time, uh, after this revolution, we have we had a war in the south part of Ukraine, mm -hmm. and okay, my mindset was changed already. Mm -hmm. But friends of mine who lived in the south Ukraine was still with uh, that mindset. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, the interesting point is that I could I couldn't explain to them. Uh, what happened in uh, Kyiv, mm -hmm. for them it was like, I uh, you know, all about Bandera, Nazi, mm -hmm. all about that. I've been an English teacher in Ukraine for two years now. Most of my students are in their mid-teens and incredibly bright, social and aware young people. These are the kids who have lived on the edge of total war for as long as they can remember, and they mock Putin openly with the only weapons they're old enough to wield. Memes, antipathy, black humour. How could they ever be conquered? They grew up free on the internet. I teach the kids that will be the nations tomorrow. That's an incredible honour and responsibility. The artists and politicians and scientists under construction. The builders and architects and sportsmen. They will be mothers and fathers and teachers and I really believe that they will change our world. Because our world still looks at Ukraine and sees the injuries of its past. Injuries that will take time to heal. But one day soon the present will break free from the clutches of the past and will see the thriving and dynamic country that these kids and their parents and their grandparents will all have made possible. But first, this moment has to be survived. Stay united and together. Here. Okay, class. Um,
Slava Ukrajina. Heroes of Slava. 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 It's getting late now, isn't it? And somewhere beyond our vision still are those crosshairs. How many of them now? Hundreds of thousands of dark little chambers loaded with bullets and ill will. Evil boy soldiers trained to hate danger, no fiction. Supposedly, if you put a frog in cold water and increase the temperature slowly, that frog will be oblivious to the danger that it's in. Even as it's being cooked alive, it won't try to escape. It'll just stay there, burning in hell, until it's far too late. I only recently found out that's just a metaphor. It's not actually true. Because as the war rhetoric gets hotter, more and more expats within Kiev's international community are starting to leave. There is something in the air now, something in the way the wind has changed in the last few hours or days. What was unknown beginning to form, becoming something to fear. The embassies are closing and people are thinking in the back of their minds about the airlifts that happened in Afghanistan and the cursed souls that were left in Kabul. It's not just you then. Oh, you're making the documentary, that's right. Yeah. Hey. Yeah? What's good? It's okay. What's up? And I realized, like, as long as there's guns pointed at each other, there's, like, a risk of a war. Mm -hmm. So I don't really want to be here when that happens. I don't know, things have cooled down. But yeah, like, I decided about... But Ukraine has been our home, the rock upon which our lives have been built and shared together. Most things we can't take with us, just some clothes and some papers, and the lights behind our eyes, eyes that have been opened by the things we have seen. What book are you reading at the moment? Mm, the Second Hand Time by... Alexandra, no, Svetlana Alexandrievich. Um, mm -hmm. And it's essentially, it's a collection of long form interviews um, or like monologues um, that she did, I think, between the early 90s and the 2000s. Um, monologues on? On what it was like living in the Soviet Union for just regular people. Like she's interviewing everyone from like a former mine worker to um, like musicians to doctors to even um, a former member of the Kremlin. Why do you decide to read the book? I just stumbled upon it. Um, Where? In Berlin, in a very well sorted book bookshop. And um, I guess I picked it up because I felt a little bit, um, despite having lived in Odessa, a little bit under-informed. Um, or rather, I wanted to dive deeper into, into the subject. Subject of Ukrainian history? Um, of Soviet history. Of Soviet history. Mm -hmm. And what, why, you said that you lived in Odessa. Mm -hmm. Like, what, what interests you about this region? Um, I guess I never was interested until I actually lived there, um, because it's so looked, I guess in the West it's sort of portrayed as a, almost as a non-place, um, like people don't really think about it or talk about it except in a sort of, um, negative or a little bit dismissive manner um, and so I never actually knew much about it until actually it being Ukraine it being Ukraine mm -hmm. um, yeah or Eastern Europe in general um, mm -hmm. but yeah having not really seen any other places outside of Ukraine in Eastern Europe yeah Ukraine did you know much about the political situ situation in Ukraine in 2014. No, just the case. Mm -hmm. Just to that extra moment our eyes hold the meeting up. The 
ever so slightly denuding spark we button up Here's to mighty mountains watching over little ponds Odysseys of many creatures, they host every dawn For every melody trapped in a song There's a world out there scurrying, hurrying on oh, and For every wrinkle burrowing calmly Into my skin there's a person that formed me Here is pretty small Here's the leaf in infinite Here's the moment, here's the pond Here the mountain we would don Here the curtains alive in flames The first time I visited Kiev, I walked down this way, over the pedestrian bridge to the River Islands. It was February 2020, and there was snow on the ground, concealing the city's secrets until we got to know each other better. It feels like the last two years are folding in on themselves, because that first day looked just like this last one. Curiosity played a big part in bringing me here. Just visiting had left me with too many unanswered questions. Here was intrinsically grand and European, but also somewhere that felt foreign and unfamiliar to me. Here history had spun out into different directions. Ukraine seemed to exist outside of time, between the walls of present-day Europe and the past that was still haunting the future. I wanted to educate myself and understand the patterns I was seeing here. It's been an intellectually fulfilling couple of years. But what has made my time in Ukraine so rich and dear are the people that I've met, the beautiful humans who invited me inside their open hearts, deep into the soil of their country, through conversations in the sleeping cabins of ancient trains and under the pavilions over games of endless chess, satisfying the appetites of free-range cats in Odessa and diving headfirst into the Ozera. Do you remember buying all that crap at the market in Starokonka? Do you remember the board game nights that ended in the sun rising over the Black Sea? That night we all swam naked in the dark. You took me to Tchaikovsky and shared with me the last of your Samagon at the Shash Lake. All of this is precious. Thank you.
I suppose this film exists as a historical record now, what things were like in the days before. I left on the 12th of February. Today's date is the 4th of May. Life is upside down for everyone that you have seen in this film, those in the background as well as in the foreground. No one can flourish at a time like this. That's why we meditate on the verb, to stay strong. In the last few months, unimaginable atrocities have been committed against the people of Ukraine, the scale of which Europe hasn't seen since the days of Nazi Germany. But the country continues to fight and defend itself, and that makes me incredibly proud. Adversity is the acid test for humanity. It shows us what we're made of. And it's clear now that Ukrainians represent the very best of us. I don't know what the future holds, just like I have no idea what the present holds for me. I'm a journalist. I just ask questions. I'm a writer. I sleep on a couch. Presently several couches. I've never made a film before. But this is what it means to be upside down in its most gentle form. My own thoughts, attention and gratitude lie with my peers catapulted into Ukraine's armed forces and humanitarian efforts. To you guys I say, Udachi Vam. Slava Ukraini. Hiruim Slava. Slava Mati. Thank you.